Thank you for coming, everybody. So this is officially the first digital salon back at Boulder Digital Arts. So cheers to that. <clears throat> Um, so a little bit of history, uh, Bruce and Zach started this company out of People Productions about 12 years ago, so we're very thankful that it's, you know, an independent business that facilitates the creative community, the professional community. We offer classes um, in five different disciplines, film, photography, graphic design, uh, web, and there's one more. And tonight, we're very excited to have uh, five of our featured instructors join us, whose classes you can take. They're on our website and also displayed on the walls. Um, while I catch my breath and like remember that there's a microphone. <laughs> um, you are at the craft of filmmaking. So what this means to us as storytellers, as people who are interested in impacting the world, perhaps some narcissism is involved, but you know, it's healthy, it's, it's uh, for a reason. So these folks here are gonna share a little bit with us about um, their craft. So we have, um, immediately to my right, we have Mike Scalisi. And Mike Scalisi is a editor, uh, Bruce's partner in Triple Threat Media, and teaches our video editing um, and motion graphics certificate program, as well, which is a week-long intensive, as well as several evening courses. Um, to his right. We have Dana Romanoff. Um, so Dana has been working with some wonderful film projects highlighting the national parks with her partner, uh, Amy Marquis. Did I see that correct? Um, so I don't wanna to spoil what they're gonna talk about, but some really, really exciting work that especially for us in Colorado, most people in here I would imagine would imagine themselves to be some type of environmentalist, whatever that means to you, because you are, in fact, in the best state in the union, and these ladies have been doing a great project sharing that with um, inner city youth, among others. Then we have Lowell Pierce. Uh, Lowell teaches our video production certificate program, and again, our certificate programs are week-long intensives where um, they're all around $1,000, and you get immersed in the craft. You know, all of us here are working professionals and or, you know, started with a dream and ended up here before you today. So we share um, what, what that means in terms of, you know, Lowell's courses with um, all of the technical components of the camera, of the lighting, of the jibs, of the movement of film. Um, and then we have Madeline Pollock. Madeline um, has had a very illustrious, exciting career, and you should join us for her um, Art of the Interview course. So you'll hear some of her war stories from everywhere, from Dr. Phil show, Discovery Channel, um, some a little bit here more locally. So um, we're gonna start with 10 minute presentations um, of each person on their topic and accompanying video. Afterwards, if we have time, uh, we have some fun topics to discuss us and can open it up for questions. But I'd like to start um, actually with Lowell, if that works. Um, yeah. And so speaking on camera movement and lighting styles. OK. Thank you, Dennis. Um, first, it's really cool to see all you guys coming out here. I live in Denver, kind of southwest Denver. I don't, I don't get to Boulder too often except for when I teach a class. And um, it's like a whole nother world here in Boulder, so it's really cool to see you all out here. Um, yeah, so the, the topic tonight is the craft of filmmaking, right? But let's face it, it's really the craft of video making, right, these days. I mean, most things I work on are video, all things are video these days. Uh, most movies that you see are originated in video. And when you go to the multiplex theater, they are projected on a digital projector, right? So filmmaking, I mean, the craft of filmmaking sounds way cooler than the craft of video making. So we'll go with that, OK? Uh, but uh, I think um, you know it's kind of the same tools apply for video and film. I, I started in film a long time ago. and. And uh, I was a, you know, a second AC, worked my way up to first AC. Then I got to shoot a few things. I was like, wow, this is awesome. And then everything started going to video. And I thought, hmm, I think I'll jump into video because 
it takes forever to get up anywhere in film business, it seemed like. So anyway, got a, got a video camera and uh, have been freelancing for, I don't know how many years, a lot of years. So if you guys are into video, which I think you are, uh, just want to say that, you know, it's finally getting some respect after all these years of film people kind of looking down their nose at video. And because it's really, you know, gotten very, very high quality. The tools are out there, they're affordable. Uh, so I just want to show you a few uh, tools and techniques that um, you can use as a video videographer or whatever to maybe spice up your next video project. And we have a clip. These are some very short random clips. Uh, I'm, I'm going to maybe talk over them here. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. We'll see what happens here. Um, we're going to start out with a corporate video, which is kind of the bread and butter of, you know, work around here, at least stuff I work on these days to make a living and pay the bills. So Imagine the possibilities. here's a nice opening graphic. And performance merge Use some footage. Obviously, you've got to identify the, the sponsor, the company. It's a contracting company here in Denver. Starting off with a, a drone shot, aerial shot, kind of establish where we are. NREL is a world leader in researching renewable energy technologies. Their top scientists demand a powerful... It's a little dolly shot to show in order to what they're working the on. It's a 3D imaging system. Is the energy systems integration facility. Talking head. And it's a state-of-the-art world Another aerial. Power systems and Drones are everywhere these days. It's the year of the drone. The capabilities range from Dollar shot. Electrical distribution Just like mix in a little movement a whenever you can. For simulations and modeling to uh, hydrogen vehicle fueling stations. Keep it moving. So Encore was instrumental in helping us take our initial design requirements for the facility and turning them into actual implementable electrical systems and automation systems. Encore came in and really helped Just kind of going behind the scenes here to show some, practical implementations some of their projectors and, and uh, cost effective solutions. talking head, shallow focus, try to, system you know, really meet our needs. Another dollar shot. Um, here's some footage, kind of old school aerials before drones. It's from a real helicopter. And uh, pretty exciting, but a little bit dangerous, a little bit expensive. So drones are a much better way to go, as everybody knows. But there's some things that you can't do with a drone that you can do with an aerial, a real helicopter. We shot all up and down the front range here and used the footage for different things. Um, but really, who's doing the most work is the pilot, it's Jim Durker from Air Cam in Denver. This is a t using a Tyler nose mount, which is a pretty common tool. There's an airbag real close to me, just in case. But I didn't get sick. Almost. These are some clips from a documentary about the environment and consumerism. So Beauty use aerials when you can. Eternity, gazing at itself in a mirror. Let's see what we got next. Oh, it's like a demo for Michael Jackson impersonator. A woman, pretty awesome. We're using a jib and handheld camera. So use a jib whenever possible to give you kind of a different perspective. And of course, these kind of stage lights, these show lights are really cool because you can do all kinds of things with um, smoke and um, LED lights. You can speed up the frame, frame rate, you know, do some fast motion stuff. This is interval recording.
This is from that doc about consumerism. Green screen. Oh, this is from Triple Threat Video. Slider shot. Use a slider whenever possible. Nice and easy. Told you later, they're short clips. Here's another slider shot. We're in a pond, getting our feet wet. The slow mo. It's kind of a belated Valentine video here. Boy meets girl. We just did this for a demo for a guy who wanted to do wedding videos and he wanted to make them look more cinematic. So we did kind of a engagement video for this guy. Rack focus, another little tool you can use. Throwing water in the face, always good. <laughs> twirling, um, we just slow, slow it down a little bit, kick it into some slow motion. Silhouette shot. They actually did like each other, they were engaged, so it's pretty realistic. Another dolly shot, a lot of foreground, backlit. Throwing in some fill light. Those are just a few, you know, tools, techniques you can use. Of course, uh, there's a hundred more that you can also use. Um, but, you know, I think the bottom line is whatever your next project is, whatever your budget is, see how many, how, how you can uh, use some of these tools to liven up your video. Maybe add a little bit more motion to it. Um, look for some creative angles and, uh, you know, go out there and make your next project uh, even a little bit more awesome using some of these tools. Thank you. Thank you, Lowell. So a few takeaways there. Uh, a, helicopters are freaking awesome. Um, B, in terms of, you know, if a picture can tell a thousand words, this concept that movement and you know, the, the opportunity to do something with a frame is really your vocabulary, you know, and how you draw the, eye, uh, the viewer's eye into the story or whatever the focus is that you're presenting. Um, next then, in terms of what to do with this excellent footage, we're gonna have Mike Scalisi. Um, so talking a little bit about post-production tools, um, and we here at BDA uh, offer classes in the full spectrum of the Adobe suite. So everything from um, After Effects to what Mike is gonna be talking about. So I'm gonna hand this over. Okay. Hi everybody. My name is Mike Scalisi. I am the editor and director at Triple Threat Digital. Uh, as Dana said, I also teach here at BDA. I teach the Adobe After Effects and Premiere classes. So these days, the role of an editor is really to serve two purposes. First, to be a storyteller, right? To go through all that raw footage that you have, find the pieces and put them together in such a way that tells a compelling story. And the second is to be a technician, right? To use the tools, know which tools are available, how to use them, really master the way and the means in which we create that video. Um, they almost seem to be opposite job descriptions when you really think about it. One's very right-brained, so using creativity and intuition and imagination. The other's very left-brained, right? Very technical, being logical, using reasoning and mathematics. But it's really these things that, working in tandem, that I think create a strong editor and the ability to create strong, compelling videos. Uh, who's ever heard the term, we'll fix it in post? Right? Either in a movie, maybe, or like you were working on a set and somebody said it. Somebody, we've heard that term before, we'll fix it in post. It's typically something that's uttered on a set, usually by a director, or maybe a producer, when a mistake gets made on the set. And they don't want to reshoot it. Or maybe they can't reshoot it. Or maybe they couldn't shoot it in the first place. <laughs> um, but it's basically something that gets said that is essentially saying, we're going to pass this problem along to the next guy. 
And so now it's the editor's problem. Um, as an editor, whenever we hear the term fix it in post, it usually makes us cringe a little bit, right? Because it typically means our job just got a whole lot harder. Um, but really, um, you know, fixing it in post is one of those things that actually requires you to rely heavily on both of those roles, the storyteller role and the technical side, to really pull that off. Um, so for the next part of my presentation, I'm actually going to be over here at the computer, so I apologize for that. Um, and we're going to take a look at uh, an example of how we pull all that together to actually fix it in post. I'm going to show a video here. This is the short video we did for a nonprofit here in town on water conservation. Uh, the title of the video is Life is Better with Water. Um, so the idea is we have a couple of scenarios where the water is removed from the situation, and then we have the corresponding scenarios where the water comes back, hopefully to some humorous effect. Um, one of the major challenges of this production was that it was shot during the middle of the winter. And so for the last shot where we actually needed the people on the raft, we didn't have easy access to a river. So we had to figure out some way around that and be creative. If we, let me just hop back a couple here, so. Um, luckily, uh, so the woman in the very front there is Bruce's lovely wife, Jenny, and we actually see Bruce right behind her there. Hey, Bruce. <laughs> luckily, these guys had gone on a rafting trip the previous summer on the Yampa, I believe, and Bruce had shot a ton of really great GoPro footage. So we got that footage, we started looking through it, we found a shot that would actually work really well for the end of this piece. And so we had to sort of um, shoot around that. So we were trying to be as creative as we could in production to try and match this as closely as we could to that shot. From a storytelling perspective, we wanted to kind of keep that illusion of continuity, that they're in the same raft, that you know, it's the same situation. Um, so we had Ginny show up and sit in the same position. We had her wear very similar clothing. Um, we even found a red bag and put it in the front of the raft there to sort of try to match the red bag from the, the end shot there. We just tried to do whatever we could in production to get these two shots to sort of match as closely as possible. However, there was one major obstacle that we weren't going to be able to overcome in production. It was something we were going to have to fix in post. And that was the fact that the raft in the beginning shot and the raft from the end shot were actually two different colors, right? So it's definitely something we're going to have to fix in post, right? Um, so I just want to go through a quick example of how the software and the tools available to us in Adobe Creative Cloud and sort of the seamless workflow between those two make it really easy to tie together those two aspects of being a storyteller and a technician to fix things in post and get things done. Um, here we are in Adobe Premiere. And here's our shot, if we take a look at it here. Let us see. You can see that is a definitely a blue raft, not a gray raft. So part of being that technician is knowing what tools we need to use in order to fix this. I want to use the three-way color corrector tool. That's a very powerful tool here in Premiere. Let me find my effects window. There we go. Three-way color corrector. And the three-way color corrector is a great tool because it allows me to do some advanced color correction called secondary correction. Here's my tools here. There's secondary correction. And what that means is I can selectively pick a single color, isolate that color, and then do effects or corrections to just that color range. So for this example, the blue raft here, I'm going to use my color picker here to pick the blue of the raft. And then if I switch over to my mask, I can actually see the color range I've selected. I'm going to go down to these parameters here, and I'm just going to try and adjust them to capture the entire range of this raft. So that, some more of 
that. And some more of this. There we go. Now we're getting it. All right, so there we go. I've sort of isolated my raft. If I now go back, turn the mask off there. Now when I make corrections, it's only going to affect the blue of the raft. So to get this to be a gray raft, what I need to do is pull all the color out of it. So if I go to saturation and start to turn those values down, now I have a gray raft, right? So this is pretty cool. I'm, I'm almost there. Now here's that same shot. Now here's that shot rendered out. Let's take a look at it. Looks pretty good. Except I have one major problem. Does anybody see the problem? What's that? Blue shadows are a problem, but there's also a much bigger problem. Did anybody notice? The sky. Now the sky is gray. So here we go. If we look down here, we go back up. Oh, there's the sky. Oh, look at that. It's gray. All right, that's definitely not going to help. It's definitely going to detract from the storytelling ability. So I have to take this another step. And to do that, I'm going to go into After Effects. And I wanted to demonstrate sort of the seamless um, interactivity between the two programs. So in order to fix the sky, I'm going to need two things. I'm going to need my original shot. Let me move that. There it is right there with my nice blue sky. And then I'm going to need our, my affected shot here. There she goes right there. And I'm going to want to send these to After Effects. One of the coolest things about the Adobe Suite is this ability to do dynamic linking. So now I've got my components in my, after, in my Premiere timeline. To send them to After Effects, all I have to do is right click, highlight those components, right click, replace with After Effects composition. It opens After Effects and immediately creates a new composition with both of those clips in it. So now I'm ready to start working in After Effects. I just want to jump back to Premiere for a minute to point something out. So in Premiere, notice my two clips are now gone, and it's replaced it with one single clip. This clip is dynamically linked to the composition in After Effects. So now any work I do in After Effects is automatically translated back into Premiere. I don't have to do anything except for save in After Effects. Right? So by making this process much easier, it helps me stay more in that storytelling mindset and less in that technician mindset by just making this a much easier workflow. This used to be a pain in the butt. I'd have to export things, re-import things, export things, re-import things. So anything that makes it easier lets me stay in that storytelling mindset a little more. So let's hop back into, let's find a frame of the sky. There it is. And let's hop back into After Effects. And um, the reason I want to go into After Effects is because it has some very advanced masking tools. So I'm going to use the pen tool here. If you ever use Premiere, uh, Photoshop, or Illustrator, the pen tool should be somewhat familiar to you. And what I'm going to do is put the blue sky layer on top. So there it is. And I'm just going to mask out the bottom of that layer. So in order to composite these together, I'm basically going to cut off the bottom part of this layer here. So I'm just going to draw a quick mask around it. And I'm going to flip the mask around. That's the wrong way. So now I have the blue sky from one layer and the gray raft on the other layer. After that, I would then, um, just to show you, let me go ahead and hit save. And I'm going to hop back into Premiere here and take it a moment. And there it is. It automatically updates in Premiere. All right? So I'm ready to go. Um, in After Effects, I would then spend some more time in the long, you know, same thing with the three-way color corrector. I'm going to spend some time refining that stuff. I'm probably going to animate this mask over time to make sure that that blue sky doesn't hop out of my mask and really spend some time doing that. Um, and then after all that, I would render it out. And here's the final clip rendered together. Oh, wrong one, sorry. In and out. There we go. And uh, also that blue cast, the blue shadow, I was able to remove in After Effects as well with a spill suppressor. And now I have a pretty believable gray raft, right? So now I can move on and continue with my storytelling and get on with it. Um, just want to show a couple of more quick examples. Here's a shot from a short film that we shot here on Pearl Street. Um, this was the take we needed to use because it's the one take where the actor actually nailed his lines. Um, but we had a small problem that we didn't notice in production. If you notice in the background of that cafe there, a curious young lady decided she wanted to take a look. And now she's in the movie. So. 
from a storytelling perspective, that's really distracting. As a storyteller, we always want to direct the audience's attention to where we want it to be. We want to be very intentional. So that's, that detracts from that. I always want the attention on my actors. So do they. So I was able to do a very similar workflow using the masking and After Effects. So here's the original. There she is. And she disappears. And here's the new shot after some quick work in After Effects. Now she's gone, and the audience can focus on the action, right? <laughs> there she is, and now she's gone. Pretty cool. And one last quick example. Um, so this is a great example of when things happen accidentally, right? When this happened in production, we didn't see it because things were very rushed and in post, and, you know, we're like, oh, great, now we have to fix that. Sometimes in production, you fix it in post intentionally. So in this example, we wanted to shoot our actors here in front of this. Um, they, you know, there's, they have a scene where they're playing racquetball, so they're shooting in front of this racquetball court and that big glass wall behind them. Um, and the only way to really light them was to kind of get the lights where they were. But in this result, we ended up with these giant reflections of the lights in the glass wall back here. So there was really no way around it. So we just sort of settled on, OK, we're going to have to fix this in post. Let's just go ahead and light them so they look good and try to position these reflections in a place where it was easy for me to isolate. And so, again, the same kind of workflow with dynamic linking and masking and After Effects. And there's the lights. And then after a couple of, after a little magic, now they're gone. Right? So there they are. And now they're gone. Cool. Um, so that's all I have. Thanks, guys. So what's so neat about the craft of filmmaking is that it's not just the idea and the inspiration, how you get the footage, but then the technical prowess. I'm sure probably everyone in this room has come up against um, some challenges, such as those encountered by editors. So part of the ethos of BDA is to empower people to know what to do so you can create your own films and videos. Um, so this type of thing is very detail heavy. So our formats for our classes, we start with an introductory getting started three hour class in our uh, three classrooms where we have large, large screens and you can kind of follow along in this type of format. And then we have day-long intensive hands-on classes where you're on our iMac computers or your own um, practicing for the whole day with these guys. So just so you know. So once you have your footage, you have it in post, you know, what do you do with it? What's the next thing? I mean, if you're really ambitious, you create a series. So to talk about that, um, I'd like to invite Amy Marquis. I worked at Dana's house today and she always makes me stand. <laughs> so I want to sit right now. Mike, thanks for reminding why I'm, me why I'm never going to be a real editor. <laughs> um, okay, so um, there are so many things uh, we've learned in the series that we're doing and I'll back up a second and, and tell you more about that. But um, I mean, from fundraising to distribution, there's just so much um, that we've learned. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about something that might be a little less expected, that um, might not be a, a totally intuitive thing to think about, and that's developing your style and your brand around a film. And, and that's a helpful thing to know uh, and to be thinking about if you are ever going to have to fundraise for your own work or market it and get it out there in front of the world. And, um, and part of that is, is just convincing your viewers that you're producing something unique that is important in this world. So. Um, just backing way up, uh, Dana and I are the co-directors of a series called National Park Experience. And um, many of you might know that this is the centennial year of the National Park System. So that was the original event that was driving the inspiration behind the series. And um, others might also know that one of the biggest challenges of the National Park System is that it's really only engaging a certain set of Americans. They tend to be white uh, and aging, <laughs> which is great. We love those visitors, but they don't reflect the demographics of America today, and that's a problem, uh, especially going into the next century when you want these places to be supported and um, you want people to, to recognize the opportunity that exists as an American um, who belongs you know, to, to these experiences. So um, we're, we're making a, a series of short films. Um, we've launched the first one, Love in the Tetons. You'll see the trailer. Dana's going to show that. Uh, we're currently in post-production, really close to a fine cut of the second film, which we shot in Canyon de Chez. And um, Brana, Dana's mom, <laughs> was on some of those shoots with us uh, because Dana brought her baby. Sorry, I digress. Um, anyway, those were cool shoots. And, and her two-month-old son at the time was our cultural ambassador on the ground there. Um, but um, 
so, so the whole point of these series is to uh, position young and culturally diverse characters at the center of these powerful experiences and transformations in the national parks. Um, so giving voice to, to one, a lot of parks that people haven't really heard of and paid much attention to, um, Canyon de Shea, you know, the more cultural parks, New Orleans jazz, but also, um, also giving a voice to the people who haven't had much of a voice in this space. Um, so that's our series. We're happy to tell you more after this. But you know, when we started out, I think one of the things that was most daunting to me at least was uh, trying to figure out what our visual style was gonna be with this. And you know, we've long been great fans of, huge fans of Camp 4 Collective and Sweetgrass Productions. Anyone know those guys? They're brilliant. And they're, they produce like this really, really sexy, distinct um, stuff. And a lot of really great commercial stuff, but great documentary work as well. And you know, I, I just kind of remember racking my brain in the beginning and having discussions like, what, what? I mean, I know Dana's eye, like I, and I came in trusting and knowing that. But um, as we talked about it, we realized that there are a lot of things that define um, a brand and a visual and, and a style. You know, visuals are obviously a huge part of it, but it's also, you know, what are the messages you're trying to get across? What are those those themes that you're linking together in the series? Who are the characters that you are? Um, putting out there to the world, what are uh, what are the the emotions and that you're trying to draw and the authenticity that you're trying to draw out of an interview? So, you know, as we start thinking about what our values were as storytellers trying to get these films out into the world, we um, began to realize that that's a whole host of things that that help define a brand and a style. And I think that's something that. You know, we're still figuring out the fundraising. We're still there's so many things we're still figuring out, but but that's one thing that I think we've actually um, achieved pretty well at this point. And you'll see a little bit of the evolution of that. Um, I have a couple of things I was going to show. Actually, can you pull up the website? Um, this so and this is um, I'll show you our website first, which we thank God we finally just refreshed. Um, it's uh, npexperience.com. And this is kind of where we started. We're very lucky in that my husband is a, is a super talented designer. He does a lot of our title animations, actually. He's working on some tonight. Um, but uh, so he helped us you know, run with this concept that we have. And so you know, right off the bat, like, we had a good logo and like, this nice background image and, and just this visual brand that we could launch with as we were, you know, our first big fundraising push was the Outdoor Retailer Show in 2013, where we got REI on board with our first, first film, which was super exciting. Um, but this is kind of what we started with. And it just kind of generally gives you the idea of what we're trying to go after with this, this series. And then the next step was to create a sizzle reel, which was a little challenging because we hadn't actually shot any of these <laughs> films in the parks yet. Thank God, like Dana had like beautiful still images that we could work with and just put some motion on. Um, there are a couple clips from a film that I made when I was an editor on National Parks Magazine. Um, and then we had a very generous friend who had just traveled the entire country shooting Tim Sessler, amazing cinematographer out of New York City. I don't know if any of you guys, he always has Vimeo staff picks. So um, we can show the sizzle next. Um, but this is just a little 90 second piece that um, we put together to, to just try to get other people to visualize what was in our heads about the potential of the series. Um, and we still use this today. It's still pretty accurate. You've seen the cascading waterfalls, the towering trees, the jagged rocks, the mighty bison. Now, we're here to tell you stories about the people. People whose lives have been transformed by the national parks. Because the parks are more than just pretty places. The parks help us remember what it means to be an American. What it means to be human. And how to connect with something bigger than ourselves. In 2016, the National Park Service turns 100 years old. So we can't think of a better time to introduce a compelling new film series brought to you by the editors of National Parks Magazine and their team of award-winning filmmakers. Help us make it happen.
So it was, it was thanks. It was a decent. It was a decent starting point. I think we've evolved a lot since then. But I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Dana because she's gonna dive a lot down into the details more about the actual stories. I'm Dana Romanoff, and I'm the co-director with Amy and the director of photography on the National Park Experience. And so for our storytelling, once we kind of defined our aesthetic and and our values. We, we started to define what kind of stories we want to tell um, and what our goal was. And our goal is to connect people to the stories and to do so through, through characters. Um, and we wanted to create stories that are authentic, so focusing on real people and real situations that are character driven, so the characters narrate the stories that touch on universal themes and that are also simple. And, and what do I mean by simple? And there's, uh, I've been reading uh, um, passages from Dr. Richard Raskin, who's a professor in Denmark and a short film theorist. And I'll just read a little bit about what he says about simple films, simple short films. He says, paradoxically, short films telling simple stories are most likely to be experienced by viewers as being deep because they leave a habitable a habitable space inside for viewers to enter and explore and construct meanings. Films full of clever twists or excessive details are more likely to be experienced as superficial, keeping the viewer at a distance as an observer rather than a participant. And we really wanted to bring, bring viewers inside to, to connect with our characters and to connect with our stories. Um, but that said, simple doesn't mean that it's not multi-layered um, and, and that it's just a linear storytelling. And in fact, we didn't really want to focus on linear storytelling. And what I mean by that is we're looking for stories and characters that connect things not through events, not by saying this happened and then this happened and this happened and this happened, but rather connecting through relationships. Um, so this first film that I'm going to show is actually our, our current film that we're in post-production on. And it's about it's the second film that we're doing in the series. Um, and the film is about the passing of a tradition in, Colt in Canyon de Chelly National Monument. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. It's a, an amazing national park. It's the only living national park, meaning that there's around 40 Navajo families that still have land in, in Canyon de Chelly and, um, and farm this land. So we found these amazing characters, which I can go into a little bit more. Um, but, this, but this story, it's, well, <laughs> You'll see it. <laughs> so this is the little teaser. I'd never been outside of LA. And I just remember stepping off that bus and seeing stars for the first time in my life. I just never knew that that was true. That wasn't something that TV made up. Today, we stand together, individuals from different cultures and backgrounds, in support and love of Juan and Vanessa. People who have never been to the National Park or would have seen themselves in the National Park are coming to be with us for this special occasion. Nature is bigger than the individual, and so we stand here with nature dwarfing us. The trees don't judge where you come from or what language you speak. The river won't look at your economic value. The sun won't look at you any different for walking in a certain way. This is one of the few places that we can really, as an American people, call home. We belong here with the great We still need Mike's help on, uh, on, we haven't done color or audio or anything yet, but that was just a real, a real simple teaser. Um, and although it's a simple story, we, you know, there's a lot going on in the, in the longer film, which is about 12 minutes long, and we're really trying to connect viewers through metaphor and through symbolism. For example, when, the slow, when we choose to use slow motion, um, that's every time they enter the canyon or, or exit the canyon or do some of the traditional things like planting the corn. And we also use the corn throughout them, planting the corn, playing in the corn, and harvesting the corn. 
Uh, and that's to show a passing on, passing of time and also a passing of tradition. Um, so, it is, so it is layered. And, and finding these characters, that's probably a whole other thing, but, but it's really finding these, finding these stories, which took a lot of research for this. We really researched and manifested the story um, and, and had a profile that we wanted, that we wanted to fill. And, and we found these two sisters, and, and they really fit this profile, and that's, and that's how the story evolved, because we knew kind of the story we wanted to tell and had to find the characters to match it. Uh, but it can also happen in reverse. You can also happen upon these amazing characters. Has anyone seen Wolfpack? Oh, that's, it's an incredible, well, so I won't quit. It's, that, that's an example, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's, a, it's a documentary to watch, but how a, how a person on the streets of New York City, a documentarian, happened upon these, this pack of young men um, dressed like reservoir dogs and, it be and just was like, whoa, what, what is this? And it became this amazing documentary on their lives. But so you can also just happen upon a story by happening upon characters. The next teaser we'll show is for our debut film called Love in the Tetons. And we happened to meet um, Juan Martinez, who is uh, Mexican-American and from South Central LA who and, you know, could have gone the gang route, but instead got introduced to Grand Tetons and saw the stars for the first time in his life. And years later, while he was in the Grand Tetons, met another park ranger, Vanessa Torres, who was a, from a family of migrant farm workers, and they got married. Well, Amy and I just happened to be in conversations uh, with, a, with a friend of a friend who introduced us to Juan. And Juan was getting married. This is in 2013. He was getting married that year. I was getting married that year. And so we started talking about wedding planning. Uh, but it turns out he was getting married in the Grand Tetons. And Amy and I walked away from that conversation. And like 10 steps later, we just kind of stopped ourselves and said, oh my god, a love story. And, and so what a universal theme. And what a great way to introduce viewers to, to, our, to our, uh, our, our film series and to, uh, as through this universal theme. But another thing about, about Juan and about characters in general is in character-driven storytelling, the character interaction is really what provides the vitality for the film. Uh, it's important for the character, the character to be relatable. And it's important to know off the bat whose story you're telling to allow viewers to feel comfortable with the story. Um, and you can have a character with an amazing story, but that person also has to be really good on camera. And luckily, uh, after, after meeting Juan and talking to him a little bit, we knew he was an amazing character and, and he had an amazing story to tell. So this is the teaser for Love in the Tetons. I'd never been outside of LA. And I just remember stepping off that bus and seeing stars for the first time in my life. I just never knew that that was true. That wasn't something that TV made up. Today, we stand together, individuals from different cultures and backgrounds, in support and love of Juan and Vanessa. People who have never been to the National Park or would have seen themselves in the National Park are coming to be with us for this special occasion. Nature is bigger than the individual and so we stand here with nature dwarfing us. The trees don't judge where you come from or what language you speak. The river won't look at your economic value. The sun won't look at you any different for walking in a certain way. This is one of the few places that we can really, as an American people, call home. We belong here with the Great Tetons. So that's just two examples. There's, thanks. Um, there's so much more that goes into it, uh, just from the, the music, which is a huge part of our films, the styling of the titles and the fonts. But, but in closing, I think we follow a, a less is more principle in a way. We really want to tell a complete story and bring that story full circle. But we want to leave the viewer um, with something meaningful to really replay in their mind and to take away from. So we hope that we're doing that in our films. 
Thank you, ladies. Dana Romanoff, Amy Marquis. Um, so that brings us kind of full circle to the why. Why do we make films? Why, why bother? Um, it's so interesting because film can be categorized both as a performing art and pretty much any other art that you would like to slice and dice. And so we've talked about the technical aspects, um, how you find an audience, but then really, Part of the integral role of the filmmaker, which everybody here does so well, is bridging that gap between what's in your head, you know, your ego, and your audience, because it's in, it's not necessarily a ends justify the means experience. It's it's the journey of people's real lives and your life, not just if you're working in documentary, but fiction as well. So, in order to you know have that that rapport and um, have that be a meaningful experience that's communicated effectively. You both have to be very organized, but also somewhat charismatic and somewhat of a people person. So with that, I'd like to hand things over to Madeline Pollock. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I've worked with um, Mike and Dana and Lowell all before. They're all excellent at what they do, and I know that Amy is too because of what we just saw and from what Dana tells me. So it's pretty exciting to be here with them. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the importance of pre production and uh, producing and interviewing and kind of what happens and being prepared for um, what you are going to be doing that day and why. Um, what can go wrong. And I feel like my job as a, as a producer is I'm constantly thinking what can go wrong and preparing for it so that when I get there, I've thought of everything. And sometimes it bleeds into my personal life where I'm doing that constantly and it gets my, drives my husband crazy. But <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, there's some really basic questions that you have. This is a whole class or you know, uh, experience that you learn about, you know, pre-production, okay, are you prepared? Or have you figured out, like, um, is the person that you're interviewing a good interview? Dana just kind of touched touched on that a little bit, but, um, you know, there's just, there, there are like basic questions you're gonna ask the person that you're interviewing, as well as basic things you're gonna find out about where you're doing the filming. For example, are there dogs around? Uh, do these people have a baby? Can you get rid of them? I mean, these are things that, you know, you really have to ask in production. But when it comes down to uh, pre-interviewing somebody, you really wanna find out before you spend your time and resources getting yourself and potentially a crew, if you're not a one-man band, to an interview. And um, when I first started out, here's a little example of an interview that I did that went awry, which was really horrifying for me in many ways, but exciting at the same time. I was doing a show for the Learning Channel about people who do really extreme sports, mostly sports, but people who do really extreme things. And I was interviewing, um, uh, the story that we were covering was a woman, well, she was a 15-year-old woman who had been completely obsessed with being a pilot since she was two. And her parents indulged her in this in every way possible, including getting her flight lessons before she could actually get a pilot's license, including raising money to go to Russia, where she could fly a MiG with an instructor in the plane with her. So she had done unbelievable things. And I was really excited to meet her. And so when I got there, uh, we, I was going to be filming her doing a dog fight in a place outside of LA, which are two planes fighting in the sky. And um, when I got there, she was you know, chatty enough and um, seemed fine. And this story was handed to me. Um, so I actually didn't pre-interview her, but I did talk to her parents before I got there. So my friend is directing, I'm producing, and it's, you know, I'm pretty new at this. And uh, we get there and she says, well, she looks at us and she said, well, which one of you is going in the other plane? And I was like, oh my God. And my friend Andy, who's a director who's British, she was like, oh God, I've got to be on the ground. I've got to direct what's being said in the sky. And I was like, right. And this 15 year old says to me, well, you only live once, right? Oh. So I was like, well, I'm not gonna have a 15 year old tell me that. I've got to get, I've got to go on the plane. And I actually had wanted to be a pilot, like a distant fantasy, right? So I get into the flight suit. I've eaten breakfast, unfortunately. And you know, we, we take off, and I'm suddenly, I'm, I'm hooked with her by Mike, 
so that I can interview her in the sky. And that was the point, because it would be super exciting to hear, you know, we're seeing footage, we're filming this from the ground, and to see what she would actually say in the sky and be able to interview her. So we are literally like doing corkthroughs through the sky. I am doing like, you know, 360 this way, and I'm throwing up. It's extremely embarrassing. And then in between throwing her up, I am asking her questions in the sky. She's clearly winning uh, this dog fight, and it's against the instructor. She's really good. And so I'm like, so Julie, how did it go? You know, what did you think? You just won that one. She was like, yeah, it was pretty good. And I, and I kept asking her questions to get her to be expressive. And I could not get anything at all of interest from her. And um, it was extremely frustrating. So, you know, we go through the whole thing, and I've now vomited in this bag several times, and we finally land. And, you know, when, you're, when you get motion sickness from that kind of thing, it lasts all day. But anyway, so I go out, we go and do the interview, and I'm still, now she's on the land, and I'm asking her questions or some kind of descriptions about what she has done, which is unbelievable, and she can't, cannot give me an answer that is usable in any way to describe the footage that we have just shot. Okay, so that is a problem right there with pre-production. Like when you interview somebody on the phone, you've got to find out, are they articulate? Can they give you details about their experience? Do they want to be on camera? Huge important question, because being on camera, especially on TV, is like a national or international or web viral event that they can't control. So there's a huge commitment that goes into being on video of any kind, really. It doesn't have to be TV. So that was a little crazy and a really good learning lesson for me for pre-interviewing. And we ended up, you know, when you're in this kind of situation, I had to totally compensate by interviewing the parents and getting a lot of description from them and doing what we could. And it was just like, you know, pulling teeth. It was hard because there wasn't anyone really like her out there that we could replace her with that we knew of in that short amount of time and, and you know, crazy TV timeline. Um, but um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about a little bit, because I, I find people don't really talk about this much, and often as producer directors, we're kind of out there on our own. And um, I've been in situations where there's been a real ethical issue for me as a director to actually put somebody on TV. And that's another pre-production kind of issue. So for example, I was doing a show about international kidnapping in Ecuador uh, for the Discovery Channel. And this was, I pr was producing, writing, and directing it. It was all my ideas and you know, discovery was just approving it as they went. So I felt a heavy burden on what I was covering in this show. And I was, um, I was uh, picked a story about a guy, an American guy and four Ecuadorian scientists who had been kidnapped in the Amazon jungle in Ecuador. And the, um, the tribe, the tribesmen from this tribe that kidnapped them th thought they were from the oil company an N oil company. Now the oil companies were doing a lot of, wreaking a lot of havoc on land. They were taking so much money out of Ecuador and these tribes people knew it and they weren't getting any of it and they were fed up. The guys that I were interviewing were scientists that were liaisons between uh, energy company, uh, and between the gas companies and environmental companies, and they were trying to go in and in a way be peacemakers and try to figure out the best way and uh, best environmental way for them to get oil. So they weren't working directly for the oil company. They were kidnapped in the jungle and um, they were held captive for about five days. So I, the, the American scientists' parents lived in DC and they were higher up politicians there and I interviewed them. And so um, through the course of working on a show about inter international kidnapping, I found out a lot about what happens in kidnapping. One of the things being that if you get kidnapped in a, a foreign country, in a lot of ways you're shit out of luck. Like the, you know, the US government is not gonna step in uh, unless you know, you've got parents that are higher ups in DC and you, you can pull strings. It's so political and it's so complex. 
But I suddenly realized, you know, as I was doing my research, that by putting this guy on camera in Ecuador, and this was going to air in Ecuador, and he was continuing to do his work, so he was yet again going to be a potential kidnapping victim, that by airing the fact that his parents are higher ups, that he is featured on a discovery show which makes him look like he's got money, you know, and that he's important enough to be on TV, all of a sudden, he's at risk because if somebody's seen him on TV and he's kidnapped, they can negotiate for much higher rates and the stakes get higher and higher. And it became like a real dilemma for me because I thought, you know, I don't want to be the person responsible for this guy getting kidnapped again. They got out. Um, two of the scientists who are Ecuadorian became the negotiators in how they got out um, of this situation. It was super hairy. And um, so it, it was just an ethical dilemma for me. And I realized I have to get, I've got to get square with myself about this, and I've got to really discuss it with this guy and make sure he knows what he's doing and that what are the implications of being on TV because a lot of people are freaking clueless about, oh, I was nobody knew me yesterday. I just aired on TV and all of a sudden everybody knows my story. People are contacting me from my past that I know. It's just, it's amazing what can happen. So um, anyway, I had a long discussion with him about it. And he was, he heard what I was having to say and he's like, yes, you're right. He said, but here's the thing. I really want to do the story. I want to be, I want this story to be told. And so it gave me a certain, um, it gave me a certain peace of mind that this guy, you know, it's his choice, but it's my responsibility. And, you know, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go with this. And he wanted to do it. I mean, it was pretty much with anybody that I interviewed um, in that situation. Um, uh, you know, it also, an ethical conversation also comes up. I was doing a show about um, teens. It was, it was a teen talk show slash documentary featuring teens who had, um, committed suicide, or who, who knew people had committed suicide. So it's a total taboo topic, and when you're a teen, the fact that, I mean, a lot of people hide that they've tried to commit suicide because it is so taboo. And if you're 14 and you say, I want to go on TV talking about committing suicide and I'm happy to do it, you might not feel so happy when you're 16 or 17 or when you're wanting to become a state representative or something in your history. So that was a really big dilemma for me. And I really, when I chose these kids to be on the show and when I interviewed them, I really had to go through the process and I had to really trust myself around this and trust these teens as well as their parents that they were read, ready to do that. And I think it's a, I don't really hear people talking about it much in our field, but even on less, uh, on lighter topics, even by the mere fact of appearing on TV, you, you're, you're doing something that you just can't take back. And, you know, I'm not saying it's a negative thing. In a lot of ways, it's a super positive thing. But uh, it's, I think it's just good to have that conversation. And um, I, I think, you know, when you're out in the field, it's really kind of good to be ready for anything. Like I said, it's, it's really good to be prepared for anything. One of the things that happened to me when I was in Ecuador was that um, I had interviewed the, the head of the, not the head of the CIA, but the head of the guy, the guy who, at the CIA, who does um, uh, negotiations when, when it comes to dealing with foreign uh, hostage situations. And I said to him, you know, hey, uh, so I'm going to Ecuador. And my radar was completely up because I'm doing a show about international kidnapping. And so, of course, everywhere I went, I was like, oh my god, I'm going to be kidnapped. And I'm with the crew, and they're going to want the camera. I mean, I don't usually travel that way, but my radar was up. And I said, so would you go, um, would you take, would you go to Ecuador? And he said, yes, I would go to Quito, the capital. And I said, well, would you go into the jungle? And he said, no. Uh, he said, I would not take my family. I said, would you take your family into the jungle? He said, no, I wouldn't. So I was trying to gauge for myself and do my research. This is the whole prep thing. Like, before you get there, just do as much research as you can, ask around. Of course, when we got there, and I was with mostly Ecuadorians who knew their way around, they said, do you want to go to the jungle? And I was like, yes, I want to go to the jungle, because I felt you know, comfortable, and I knew what the risks were. But it was interesting. So we just decided on the fly, when we were in the jungle, we found a hut, which was somewhat like the hut these guys were kidnapped and caught in to do a um, 
kind of a, re, not a cheesy recreation, but a recreation of what had happened. And in that, we did an interview, but then, you know, the Ecuadorian was very concerned about being on TV, so we had to film him in the darkness and, you know, make all these decisions on the fly. So it's just interesting. You really need to be super flexible and, uh, you know, are you giving me time or are you asking a question? Sure. Time? What's, oh, both. Okay, gotcha. Denise just chimed in. Okay, go ahead. So uh, I'm just curious now, you said you were a little green back when, when you interviewed this fighter pilot young gal. Uh, do you think you would elicit a different response knowing what you know now, kind of if you had to do that over again, taking your experience back in time to do that flying again, to approach it differently? Um, so I think that um, I would have been a better, better interviewer, but I can't say that she would have been a better interviewee. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure about that. But one thing that I would have done was gone to my boss at the time and said, this is what we're dealing with, just so you know. Because then they know that all this money they're investing is, you know, going to have some huge hassles in post. And we're going to have to cover for it in some way. And I always think it's so much better up front to know what you're getting into for everybody involved. And it affects budget if you're getting into a situation like what Mike was talking about. If you have to get into a situation in post where you're doing so much correcting, that's a huge budget inf uh, issue. But would you have gone up in the plane? <laughs> yeah. I'm an adventurer. That's what I love about this job. It is so cool and exciting to go out into the field, and I would do it again, and I've done crazy, stupid stuff since. So. <laughs> and uh, what's next on the horizon for you right now? Um, I, um, I've got a, a few things brewing. One is with Corey right here, who's sitting in the front. Um, and uh, I've also... I've. I'm directing something coming up, but it's a, for a pharmaceutical. I do a lot of um, corporate um, web video commercial stuff. Um, and I'm also doing, I hate to say it because I'm up here presenting, I'm doing public speaking uh, and pitch coaching for creative companies. I'm, I'm, pitch, I'm coaching them in how to pitch and stuff like that. So um, I really love the human interaction and the interviewing and the, um, I have a background in theater and directing theater, so I'm, I love supporting people and their thing, doing what they love to do. So that's kind of, I've just added that to what I do. All right, well, thank you, Madeline. Can we give one more round of applause for our presenters here? Thanks so much, guys. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to say something on Facebook or Twitter or email us. Um, since you came to this event, uh, we will make sure that you are invited to our next digital salon. Um, so this concept of inviting you know, thought leaders, inviting the public, providing an opportunity for people to share ideas. We really, really thank you for coming.